Bruce Feldman from Fox Sports and The Athletic is here on The Rich Eisen Show. Once again, it is great to see you. What is happening at UNLV, Bruce Feldman? So what is happening? There's actually, it's like the epicenter of the college sports world right now. This, and because I've never seen this. Well, there's two things that are going on. One okay. is related to, and this is the old story because it's been going on for like the last, largely the last 48 hours, is UNLV is in play for the Pac-12 and also the Mountain West and conference realignment. That's now old news. I mean, it's still going on, but it's really, UNLV is 3-0. and Their starting quarterback, Matthew Sluka, had, be, had, had a really good career in FCS at Holy Cross, transferred. Uh, more of a running quarterback than a than a than a uh, passing quarterback, but again, they're three and zero. Oh. Mm-hmm. They beat or, Kansas. They beat Houston, right? Yeah, two Big Twelve wins, you know, pretty handily. And they are sitting there. Yesterday, it's, word starts to circulate that he is going to basically opt out and won't be playing the rest of the season. Now, from what I had heard initially, was that he wanted to take this year as a redshirt, where you're allowed four games and then could get more money uh, someplace else and go on the, go on the market for a for 2025 uh, season. But then this morning, after, after he puts out a statement, I think a lot of people are going, this kid quit on the team and everything like that. Um, his parent, his dad spoke to multiple outlets and said, okay, well, he was supposed to get $100,000. He's not getting anything close to that. Now, let's talk about like whether it was a verbal agreement as opposed to a written contract. And this is where everything gets really murky in the NIL space. And I think we talked about this at some point. I know this we is... no question we've talked about yeah, that. Like uh, last, uh, I don't know, probably like five months ago, The Athletic, we did a big story where we talked to agents and players and coaches and everybody involved in the process and collectives. And one of the things one of the players who's now in the NFL had told me was the, when it comes to money, what's, what's happening a lot, and I'm not saying it's happening in every case, mm-hmm. is a player may think they're getting a million dollar deal. It's, it's cryptic in this regard because this player explained, he was like, yeah, you may have access to a car that's worth $100,000. You don't own it. You have it for like four months. You may have access to a $750,000 home, but you don't own it. You, you, you know, so it's like the value you think you're getting is a million, but it may not be. Now, I'm not saying it's going on this in this case with Sluka, but what is interesting is if you or I did a deal and we, it was a verbal agreement, like, I don't know. Then it's it, it's going to be interesting to see what was signed and what wasn't. And I'm not saying that the that the school is because again, it's it's all this third party stuff. You get in this area where it's not supposed to be pay for play, but it actually always is. Um, You're referring to collectives and things. I'm of that referring nature? to how NIL is structured in a lot of ways right now. Um, you know what's what are what the contracts are, who's involved in the negotiations. Um, it's just, it's a real, like, very um, unwieldy setup right now. People want the NCA to be in more, involved more, but the NCA is, like, kind of boxed in right now with, with a lot of court cases and what judges are ruling. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen before somebody issuing a farewell thank you meme, right, right after three games with a statement that clearly... 100% lays out this is over money. Mm-hmm. And we can sit here and say kid's quitting on his team or we can sit here and say kid got robbed. But the one thing that we can definitely say for sure is that there's no piece of paper and there's no way that this could be, I would think, unless these things are signed and filed with some form of a of an entity that's right. in charge that short of that we're going to see stuff like this more often we're now seeing we're seeing players demanding something otherwise they're not coming to a school we're seeing players demand something otherwise they're leaving school but we've never seen it three games in from the starting quarterback of a team that has an opportunity to play in the college football playoffs if they keep on winning. Right. Never seen that before. And it's really jarring to me, man. I'm not going to lie. And, and it makes me sit here saying, who's going to be the adult in the room? Is it Sankey? I know Sankey and Petiti already are, are 
having um, conversations and what their working group were talking like. We got to get past working groups here, man. But it's really hard for them to kind of rein this in because I think you have different jurisdictions. You have different, you know, court cases that are coming up that are kind of boxing them in. When you're talking about whether players are being paid, the the, the talent fee that t- Tennessee is putting on its tickets to to pay f- in advance of uh, of having to pay all athletes. Well, you're right having now? these third party groups that are involved, and I think that again, it's different than what happens in in the NFL or the NBA or Major League Can Baseball. Can you describe what you're describing as a third party person who might so somebody out there? You're talking about agents, other yeah. Other I mean, it absolutely saying? could be agents who get involved in the process. They they may not be some may not be certified. Many you hear aren't, um, and then. Like I know of a specific situation of a very highly ranked uh, recruit who was supposed to get a million dollars, got maybe 20% of that last year. Now, the from what I told the school's point was, this player didn't live up to their end of the bargain. Now, what does that mean? That they didn't do the things that were mandated in the contract to get that money, or they just weren't that as good as expected on the field? Is, is, is there a contract? Are there contracts? I think there are contracts. I don't know the specifics on this one because right now, you know, we've heard from a secondhand account out of out of uh, from the, what we think is the UNLV side initially, and we've also heard now from a um, an agent representing the quarterback and the quarterback's dad. Mm-hmm. But at this point, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where everybody's going to look bad in it. You know, at this point. Yeah, I mean, because mm. the quarterback would rather stand on whatever principle. We don't know what standing he has on and what principle, uh, referring to money, has been offered and paid or anything like that. The, the, the father has said it. or and, and there are teammates who might be looking at him saying, where are you going? Um, but that said, if he was promised this money, and it is in a contract somewhere, then why you know I, I don't know why the recourse is is to to leave and say I'm I'm doing this now before my eligibility is up, and thus going to make myself Go available to market to the again highest bidder. So wh- and so a school would be hi- hiring the kid because let's call it what it is right. hiring the kid mm-hmm. to play college football for them in 2025, and I would imagine uh, they would have to. Um, Make sure that they're honoring their word, although his red shirt would be gone. I mean, how many times can this kid red shirt? Can he just red shirt until he's 40? I think this you know would be I the mean? last year of eligibility because okay. he, so, play, you know, I think he was the starter at Holy Cross for three years okay. to begin with. Again, I, I, and I know a lot of folks might be like, uh, why, are, why are we discussing something that involves a school that's not, say, Georgia and Alabama? They're playing each other this week. That's big, and we'll get to that in a second. But this, to me, is a, a total canary in a coal mine here. Like if I'm a if I'm a school administrator, if I'm a coach, if I'm a dad, if I'm an agent, if I'm anybody, I'm a player. I'm gonna want some rules. Like can can we get the rules done? So if there is a contract, it is filed with some central office somewhere, and that central office now going to handle this dispute. And this doesn't happen. You know. I, I think what one of the things that was interesting about this is. Years ago, I remembered when NIL first started, and it's hard to say years ago because it's not that long ago, but one of, the, one of the coaches I know is a head coach, and he said, okay, well, we'll be able to get all this documentation on who's paying what and what these budgets are because they thought it would be something that would be in the spirit of transparency, and it's actually not worked out that at way all. at all. Um, because somebody, I think it was their compliance person said, oh yeah, and this is, uh, and this is a school with not a huge NIL operation, but it's still a major college program. And it was like, oh yeah, this is how this is going to work. And it's not worked that way. I mean, I think towards your point about like, you know, it's UNLV, it's not, you know, an SEC program or big 10 program. There's a lot of stories underneath the surface that you hear about, um, where there's a lot of head scratching things that go on. They just don't get put out there in the major spotlight by the parties involved as this one did. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I had a conversation with a, with a coach um, at a big program like a week ago where he was telling me something about, they had a transfer who was pretty high profile who left. And he was like, this guy I think owes like $70,000 or, you know, in taxes on some of this stuff. And there was a lot of things that were like, 
I have no idea what's going on with this, you know, because it's like once the player leaves, it's like they're because all of this third party stuff, it's very interesting how not just unregulated, but just how unwieldy so much of it is. And I think there's so many stories that are that are like one degree from getting out there. Um, but they but they don't usually. And what are these stories that we're hearing about of players are suing for back NIL? Like, you know... Oh, you mean like Reggie? Reggie or, yeah. or Braylon Edwards and, um, and, and, and I believe Denard Robinson? Yeah, the Reggie case is super interesting. Well, what, in a is bunch that, of what is that about? Like, is it similar to Dan Marino suing the Dolphins, wanting more money because of how much Tua just made? I mean, is that is that the similar yeah. standing? I, I, I don't I know, because obviously I'm not a lawyer and I'm right. not familiar with that case. The, the part to me that's really interesting on, on Reggie Bush, you know, obviously he was a legendary player at USC. I mean, they just, you know, they just, you know, reconcile with him publicly as it relates to the Heisman and the NCAA, and he's suing the school. And I'm like, man, this is this is really interesting how this is this like subplot of this relates with Reggie and USC. I don't know. Um, I don't know how these things are going to play out. Again, like I, I don't know anything. if people are getting nobody bad advice anything. from lawyers. I, you know, I don't know. Nobody knows anything. You know, nobody knows what the Supreme Court decision is going to actually rule and how yeah. paying everybody and how that affects all athletic departments. So you might as well hedge your bet and just start putting a, ta a ticket, uh, you know, a talent fee on tickets like Tennessee's doing. And what's going on with UNLV right now? It's 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 nuts, man. How, how about this? I, I, I know it's a great way to phrase it. Tell me why Travis Hunter isn't the Heisman Trophy favorite right now. Because his team is not a top 10 team. That's I simple. Don't, I don't think you can give much of a better rationale beyond that because right now what he's doing is simply remarkable. The volume of plays, 130, 140 snaps, the volume of big game-changing plays that he makes, often way late in the game when he should have nothing left in the gas tank. Um, it'll be interesting. If they go 6-6, six and 5-7, six, and seven, I am pretty sure he will still get some first-place votes, assuming he's healthy for the whole year. Yes. I do don't know if he gets off away from the discussion like does somebody else um you know what does Carson Beck or Milro do this weekend on a big stage in a big game yes you know do they take it over but just he's such a um generational talent that I feel like we don't use that expression it doesn't fit as much because we've seen a bunch of guys win the Heisman who are really terrific players but I don't think they're doing something that's so different like he is. Yeah, 100 yards receiving, game-changing player. 130 yards receiving, the, yeah. the forced fumble to yeah. save the game. Yeah, right. It's not the first time that's happened. It's just, you know, he it's it's really, really remarkable. I mean, he was the five-star number one player in the country who has lived up to and exceeded the hype. Yeah, I, I mean, it shouldn't matter what the record is for him to at least get a ticket to New York. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I would think healthy, so. If he's healthy, so. if he's healthy, we should see him in New York City in December. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah, I would and, think so. And then hopefully get more votes, because honestly, what he's doing is unicorn stuff. It, mm -hmm. it, it really is. Uh, game of the week is Georgia and Alabama. Break it down for me. What do you think? Uh, so you obviously have, this is Kalen DeBoer, new coach at Alabama, his first you know, big, big game. Like we had them a couple of weeks ago. They played in Madison. They blew out the Badgers. What I'm fascinated with last year, so neither team, by the way, is ranked number one right now. Um, you have Texas is number one, Georgia's number two. But I think last time they met in the SEC title game, Al Georgia was one, Alabama was eight. Alabama really took over the game in the trenches. Their O-line, which had been a question mark earlier in the year, mm -hmm. really stepped up and took it to Georgia. Georgia's banged up on the on the D-line, but they're still super talented. The last time they played, which was, you know, they had a bye week last week, so the two weeks ago, they played at Kentucky. And Kentucky ran the ball, I don't want to say down their throats, but it was like 180 rushing yards. It's not a great Kentucky team. They gave them all they could handle. Um, I suspect we're going to see a... a really dominant performance by Georgia. I remember there's some there's some quotes that are, you know, lingering after the game last year about that that I sh that I know that bothers some of the Georgia players. What I'm really excited to see is is how Georgia responds, but also this is a first chance for the country to really get a good look 
at Jalen Milrow in Kalen DeBoer's system. They have really dynamic speed outside at receiver. Um, you know, I think the offensive line is good. I don't know if it's great, but it's good. But Milrow is so explosive, and he does throw a good deep ball. And again, I, like, I'm interested to see what Kalen has up his sleeve. He's a really good offense. He's just a great coach. Uh, I'm not saying that I think they're going to win going away, but it's that challenge of, you know, Georgia looked terrific against Clemson in the opener, and they did not look very good the last time out. But again, this game was looming. It's not just, you know, Georgia has a loaded schedule. They still have, you know, Ole Miss and Tennessee um, left and, 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 you know, a bunch of other tests. But I can't wait to see what, what happens in Tuscaloosa Saturday. Yeah, me, me, uh, you, me, you and me both. Um, and in terms of, of you mentioning how neither are number one, you agree Texas should be number one, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, I want to say it matter. doesn't really matter. Right, you sure. know, But, like, Texas was dominant and has looked really good. Look, if, if Georgia goes in there, whoever wins this game, if it's a if it's a dominant performance, I think probably will overtake them to be number one. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. Um, this will any, all work itself any out. Any idea on, on Ewers' health at this point in time? Or? I mean, in the beginning of the week, Sark described him as questionable. I think he's going to want to try to play. Again, they're playing Mississippi State, who is really bad this year. Then they have the bye week before Red River. Um, I don't think after, you know, Arch had, had an up and down game last week against ULM. I still think they have a lot of confidence in Arch, but we all know that yours is going to be the guy. It's just a question of do you worry if he plays in this game against Mississippi State? Does he potentially aggravate it and make it worse? Yeah, certainly with a bye week careful. on the other side. And, and, yeah. and I mean, Arch is, I mean... I think he should be able to get through, get them through Mississippi State with all due respect, right? I yeah, mean, Toledo, Toledo, Toledo smashed Mississippi State. Right. So give viewers a week and or two weeks more. Two weeks, and then, yeah. And then and then, but it, it is again, it's his gig coming back, right? Like, that's oh yeah. It. Okay. I mean, there's no question about that. No. All right. Sorry, TJ, your card is still going to have to be at its current value. He's got an Arch Manning card. He just cards, rich cards. It'll be multiple, great next multiple. year. Look, Arch is uh, like I th I think play the futures game with Arch. You know? Well, the Mannings certainly are, right? There's, there's no, they're there's smart. nothing they, coming from their <laughs> camp, right? I mean, you no, know, there's some, they're smart. They look, they know better than anybody, better than anybody in the media or whatever, how to play the long game with the development of a young quarterback, right? I mean, I think it's smart. I think it's played out. I'm sure they would have loved for him to go four touchdowns, no picks last week. Mm -hmm. But I think just the reps of playing with it. It's not to say that. You know, if he gets this this other game, I think it's 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 a it, it's a better opponent. It's a, it's a it's an interesting environment to go through. I think it's all good. It's like you're you're playing with the house's money. Uh, I've got Bruce Feldman here uh, on the Rich Eisen show. Uh, anything else this week that's on your radar you want to point out? Any other games that are, are of interest to you? Yeah, um, the game with Boise State against Washington State. It's a FS1 game. It's late. I'm I'm not just trying to shill for my company, but keep shilling though. It's okay. It is a like you talked about UNLV as a potential playoff team, or you know could be coming sure? out of there. Right. Washington State. You know, they have a really dynamic quarterback, John Matier, who's a Texas kid who was under the radar recruit, had no other. FBS offers other than Washington State was committed to Central Arkansas. He is I'm not saying he's Johnny Manziel, but that's kind of what he reminds me of in mm -hmm. terms of like just makes a ton of plays with his legs. He's fun to watch. They're a really good team. Boise State has the best running back in the country. Ashton Genty, who's a t another Texas kid, by the way, ran wild for, for Boise State so far. This this is a this I don't want to say it has a playoff spot on the line. But the winner of this game is going to be in a really good position to get that, to get that kind of at-large spot. And if it's Washington State, this to me is Washington State's toughest remaining game. They beat Washington a couple of weeks ago. That was a really good win in the Apple Cup for them. Um, keep an eye on this, in this game because I think it, it's going to have – it could have big implications. Again, you're going to see in Genty, you know, maybe as a first-round running back, I mean, we can – Talk to our you know NFL draft friends who love how versatile he is, and he's going to put up huge numbers. So I think this is an under the radar great game. Fight for the 12 seed to visit uh, the 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 school that uh, just missed out on the bye week. Yeah, That's basically what we're talking about right here. And uh, I, listen, 12 versus five always works well in uh, college basketball for an it upset. Does right? You know, it's and so 12 versus five, and you you let's just say Washington State wins. 
Why wouldn't you um, – and, and uh, uh, Big Ten team, too, happens to be a team that uh, came from the Pac-12. Penn State, you just, or, or I'm just saying, I'm just, if it Oregon, like, why wouldn't you want to send Washington State into Oregon and spin that thing up? You know, like, that. that's – I'm already taking a look down the road about what, what the committee yeah. might do and things of that nature. I would you know? just say buckle up if you're the defensive coordinator. you gotta, you got to play that guy. So Interesting. Uh, what's your takeaway from Michigan USC, the most watched game of last week? What was it was fun. I it? mean, I was, you sat there and watched. By the way, like I don't know what Mull, Kalel Mulling's nil deal is, but he put the program on his back. He did. He you know, saved like, it. He and, saved the bacon. And I remember a couple of years ago, we're in Columbus for the big, you know, like that game, and they're banged up. Quorum's going to try to go, but he's got very little. Donovan Edwards has like a soft cast on his hand. Yeah. They moved. Kalel from linebacker to running back and he gave him a little and then but what he did last week and what he's done this season has been pretty remarkable I've seen some of you know some of your fans you know compare him a little to Haskins who was a punishing runner and and definitely brought something a couple years ago Mm -hmm. this is a 235 pound guy not only he put their program on their back he put on a USC player on his back you know ran down the field got rid of him and then made the play of the game and I thought that was huge. They're so one-dimensional right now. I mean, I still think it's like an eight and four team, but in in some regards, um, the D line stepped up. That was kind of what I thought they were going to look like this year, where the D line was going to get after people, which they did. You know, it's not just the two inside guys. Josiah Stewart, the Coastal Carolina transfer, has been really, really good. Uh, Will Johnson made a huge play when they needed it. And if I was a USC fan, I'd be like, you know what? Uh, it stings, but like, yes, we're not we're not perfect on defense, but we're much better. Like they made a lot of good oh, tackles. There's no question about you know, that. I yeah. mean, they're actually making tackles. Yeah, you they are. I mean, like, I mean so, and, and they're excellent. They uh, are at, at 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 not giving up the yards after the catch. At least they were against Michigan. That that's for sure. And they this they made they made the adjustments coming out of halftime. I mean, the third quarter was a dominant USC quarter. And it was a dominant USC half until Mullings. I I, I did not see the f- field flipping, game saving, potentially season season saving run coming from him at that point in time. That was something. But USC, uh, I mean, they they were putting the bang thing on Michigan after halftime. Yeah, the only issue with USC, they're not they're not great on the D line, and they're not really good on the O line, and that got exposed. Um, but if I was a USC fan, my biggest concern now is, man, we got to keep Danton Lynn here because the defensive, coordinator. the defensive coordinator, Anthony Lynn's son, was great last year at UCLA, has been terrific. Um, you know, he's he has done such a good job. He's so well thought of by people who have been around him. And, you know, look, that's a problem that he's done so well that, you know, maybe somebody tries to hire him as the as their head coach, you know, maybe somebody in the NFL, I, I don't know, you know, but I think he's been, he's been as good as you could have hoped to be. And we'll see how much better they can be. I, I think like, again, USC just needs to upgrade. I was saying this, like it's easy, needs to upgrade on the O line. They need to certainly upgrade the D line, but you know, Miller Moss had the, had the pick six, but otherwise, I mean, he hung on the pocket, got a, took a beating. He's really good, I think. And, and they have good receivers. And obviously Lincoln knows exactly what he's doing offensively. I think there's a lot of encouraging stuff if you're a USC fan. And it was funny because I, I, one of, one of the people I know pretty well is, is, you know, works at USC. And we talked about this, like in the summer, I was like, you just need to get to games. You know, it was like, because all this other stuff is not helping. It's like conjecture and everything else. Mm -hmm. How well they're doing recruiting, what's going on with NIL, all this other stuff. Now the games have happened. And yes, they're not undefeated, but they got a nice win over LSU. They've dominated a team like they should have, you know, which they didn't always before when they, you know, thumped Utah State. And they they almost won. And and again, I think there's a lot of stuff that they can build off of. Yeah, I I hear you. I fully agree. Um, Enjoy being at home this this weekend and we'll see you we'll see you next week and see what happens between georgia and alabama yeah can't wait me neither can i that's uh bruce feldman right here on the rich eisen show don't go anywhere hour three with the actor jonathan davis in studio from outer banks still here on roku uh do you want to you want to hit the that acc battle between central new york and uh and the bay area that nobody would ever consider acc football it's just weird Man. Heartbreaking loss for the kids. Did it, you know, Friday. to me, when I'm watching it, we I can't spri- tackle you know, anybody. Well, 
it looked like you were playing Indiana. It didn't look like Stanford. The uniforms were like, yeah. right? So. I don't know. We can't tackle anyone. <laughs> Kyle McCord's really good, though, still. Yeah, I saw, by the way. Two I, bad picks. But. I, I, I know, he, he, but he, he's kind of. Uh, he's really good. Yeah, like he finds the open receiver. Yeah. He makes the throws. Yeah. You know, I mean, he. Good army. I mean, he was a five star for a reason. You know, he yeah. was he was not you know going broke, taking the profit. He was doing a lot of that stuff, yeah. and you I know, just think he's a little, like a little. It's unfortunate because there's such a drop off from you had C.J. Stroud to whoever. It's his first year as a starter. He's not. He's not. He is not very elusive, but he throws it well, and obviously he's. You know, I think year two is going to be much better for him. It's unfortunate for him that like you know, like we saw Ohio State in person last week. J.J. Smith is phenomenal. And they have like they're six or seven deep that are better than almost anybody else's best receiver. And I got 15 seconds left, so I guess this is uh, just a quick answer. The second best team in the Big Ten is a traditional Big Ten team or somebody that just came from the Pac-12. Uh, I think it's Oregon, but their offensive line still gives me concern. Okay, but and then if not Oregon, it would be Penn State. It would be two. Yes. Okay. Thanks for coming on here, sir. Catch the Rich Eisen show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.